My wife and I have enjoyed being here for the last few months. And, uh, well, we've went through, what is it now, three lessons on wisdom I think we're at. So we're in the 40 days of focus. First one was relationships, super helpful. Uh, the next one was uh, fitness, and we had nutrition. And then we're moving to money and media next. So if you guys are kind of looking for a, a preview, that's where, where we're going. That's where we've been. Um, and today we land on, on money. Money. Yeah. Hey, Ben, you're new. <laughs> Why don't you teach on money? It's actually really cool because if, uh, if nobody likes it, you can kind of remove me. And then it's like I said all the hard stuff. And then Dan's got a scapegoat. Uh, I'm joking. Actually, you guys, I'm really happy. I didn't have to preach on money. I mean, on uh, fitness, excuse me, and nutrition. It is the world that I kind of, I, I run in that world. I have a resume there. You know, I run a gym. Uh, but for me, I, I talk in absolutes around those topics sometimes, and I draw a character um, reference uh, based on how somebody is doing their fitness, and it would just, it would sound so uh, hypocritical because what I end up doing is somehow attach your level of holiness to your ability to run a fast mile, you know? And it's like, it, the two are not even close to the same thing. So Dan saved me from myself in that because uh, there are many saints who don't enjoy the gym like I do who are challenging me all the time in my faith. And so, uh, money. We're going to rely on God's word this morning to teach us about money. Funny thing is, the world... Uh, the world doesn't really do that. Okay? Our culture today, especially in America, it does not do that. It doesn't go to God's word for uh, any kind of practical help. It doesn't use it to create boundaries for any of us. It doesn't really even give us direction like the word of God does. The world just wants to do things its own way. It's kind of led by materialism, right? Uh, I think maybe 20 years ago, it was like a bumper sticker on like, he who dies with the most toys wins, right? Then Christians came up, came up with, uh, he who dies with the most toys still dies, right? Because that's true, and uh, it doesn't matter, and we'll look at a little bit of that. But when we get led that way, we start to think in line with that. It's about moving up the, the, the ladder, the corporate ladder, right? Increase your your business or your education, you know, it's just promote, chase, grind, you know, it, it gets in this, the rat race that we're familiar with. And honestly, we were all feeling a little bit like we're in it at times as Christians. I'm not really saying that there's a ton wrong with that in its context, but I do want to look at the Word of God first before I say it is good or it's bad. There are many empires, literally empires built on just how to get rich. You know, the books or the podcasts or the personalities that are built around that idea because nobody likes their economic situation, their financial situation. They want to move from one class to the next one up, not down right? And so people sell that. It's, it's everywhere. And I think that we've all seen that. In fact, many of us, myself included, what, how to get rich, how to add $2,000 here or whatever, how to make your bills or how to, how to, how to, and we're constantly looking for answers like that. Well, those empires might tell us how to get rich, but let's look at the New Testament, we're going to look at 1 Timothy 6. I'm going to give you a, a verse because we're going to try to take a big look at the whole chapter. Okay? And we're going to read it because there's a lot there. We need to look at every brush stroke eventually, but we need to look at it in its whole so that we can have an idea about what Timothy is hearing from his mentor, Paul. Okay? But before we do that, I'm going to pray one more time, kind of uh, 
we're in this wisdom series, right? Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, when asked by the Lord, what do you want? Wisdom. And he said, Solomon, because you've asked for this and not long life, right? Some of us would ask for that. Some of us are really concerned with how long we live. Some of us would ask for great riches or whatever. God honored that and gave him wisdom. So we're going to ask God for the same. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for your word that you've protected, you've safeguarded for thousands of years to end up in our hands this morning. I pray that you would uh, give us wisdom as we break it apart and we try to think Paul's thoughts after him. We try to receive it like Timothy would and then apply it in our own life. Lord, your word says the fear of the Lord, fear of you is the beginning of wisdom. And so it's where we start, your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Make mention of the word, you guys. Um, been trying to, as so I teach more, figure out my, my style. I like the iPad, okay? It's helpful, but I have to remember to turn my notifications off, you know? And um, what's he talking about? There's a point to this, actually. Some of you guys are, are uh, phone Bible people, right? Phone Bible people? Raise your hand, phone Bible people. Yeah, heathens. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. You just got to remember to turn off your notifications. How many of you guys have been sucked into it? You're in, you're in church. Just scrolling. Wait a second. This is, this is, this is Instagram. <laughs> what am I doing here, right? Or we're scrolling. This is Pinterest, right? Or we're texting because something made you think of someone else, you know? And I just want to encourage you guys that there are no notifications if I bring in this, okay? So... Because I have the microphone, paper Bibles win, okay? So, but nonetheless, you guys, I'm just going to encourage you guys towards uh, at least silencing your notifications, not for the disruption, but for the own disruption of the way the Holy Spirit wants to maybe work in and through each one of us, okay? So, 1 Timothy 6, how do we do this? Why don't we all stand while I read the Word of God to us? In verse 1, let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who, have been, those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Reading out of the ESV, if you guys didn't know, I'm going to continue reading, so we'll stand for a few more moments. Teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up in conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we, can take, we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith, take hold of eternal life to, to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses, I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and to Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed 
and the only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be the honor and eternal dominion. Amen. And last portion here. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for them, themselves as a good foundation for the future, so they may take hold of that which is truly life. And since we read so much already, we'll finish those last verses. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. You guys can have a seat. That was a lot. And I don't expect you guys to remember everything uh, from that reading. But I wanted to, like I said, give us a really good picture of the whole painting, right? Like a stand back and, and look at the whole before we go in and we look at the details, okay? So this chapter is structured with slaves, bond servants, depending on your translation, addressed first, right? You remember in verse one, he says, let all who are under a yoke as bond servants regard their own master. So he's going to them first. Then he does a b whole bunch of other stuff in the middle, which we'll break down. And then the very end, it's almost like a postscript. He addresses the rich. I really find this interesting because it's not really how we work. We don't work that way as people, right? Think about it. In today's culture, we want to address the rich first, those who have a lot, the good-looking, right, the powerful. Those are the people we want to go to. Those are the people we give our time to. We don't look to give our time and our energy and our focus to the least. In fact, we have to be told in the Bible all the time, take care of orphans and widows, the helpless, right? We have to be reminded of that and, and prompted to do that because in our nature, we don't do this, but God is so different than us, which is refreshing, right? It's really refreshing, especially when you understand where you sit in regards and relationship to the cross. But yeah, this, this happens all the time. We address the rich, and sometimes we don't even want to address the lowly. We just kind of pass over them. We drive by them. We go, wow, that's a really messy area of the street. People live there, you know, and we just pay no mind. We're going somewhere, I don't know, I don't want to just say anything too poignant, but like we're going somewhere to enjoy a $50 steak. You know, God's a little different than us. And I'm not trying to point fingers, you guys, because I've done it. <laughs> I do it, right? But that's why it's written here, it's for us so that we don't always do that and think that that is okay, right? God is different. Matthew 20, 16, Jesus says, the first shall be last, the last shall be first, right? Like he's, he's painting a different picture here, a different set of priorities. You know, don't show partiality. Like Sarah said about taking care of orphans and widows, I jumped ahead of my notes there. If you go back to verse 1, and like I said, we need to start breaking this down. Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. Why? So that God and the teaching may not be reviled. You guys hear Paul is telling Timothy um, what to tell slaves, bondservants. Okay, now that word, because of our culture, uh, has a certain level of weight with it, right? Slaves, servants, bond servants, masters, things like that, they, they can kind of make us feel a little bit uneasy. 
all right? Now, in, in this day and age, uh, there were some that were kind of like chosen indentured servants that they went and chose to, to have a master. And there were some that were not just chosen. Like there was like real, there was both existed. And so I just want to say, if it makes you like twitch a little bit, he's speaking to them and he cares about them. And he wants to give them some help here. And so he's telling the slave who works for an unbelieving master, I need you to work hard and be respectful. Why? So they don't despise the things of God. They don't take and lump your work ethic and your attitude and your belief in God and put them in the same place. Right? Because when you have a bad attitude, and you're, but you're a Christian, and you got this one opportunity to witness, who can you witness to if you're a slave in that day? You can only witness to, you can't go out and wander around free. You don't go on mission trips. Right? You can't be driving down the road like I was talking about and see a homeless camp and pull in there and just start talking to them. Right? You're around a fixed number of people, maybe some other slaves, okay, and your master. So we are to be a light. You might not like who you, have to, you get to be a light to, but you are a light. And that's what the word of God tells us right there, that God cares more about your witness, okay, if you are a slave because he does not want God or his word to be reviled, okay? So we're going to be a witness, Christians who work for somebody that you don't like. You're going to be a witness. You're just going to be a good one or you're going to be a bad one, right? So we need to make sure that we're a good one. He moves on. He doesn't leave it just to, like, what, if you, what, if you work for a, what if you work for a believer? Well, then you're kind of equals, right? Just treat them as equals. He actually doesn't even say that. He says to those who have a believing master, they must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. True, right? So like they're equals, yes. Rather, they must serve all the better. So you don't get to come in there with this idea that, hey, we're equals only, and now you've now elevated yourself. You're still serving. You're still serving them. Okay? Why? Because they're brothers, and they're going to benefit from your hard work. Not only that, it says, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. So let's just say you have a Christian boss, right? You work hard, and then they have money or means. They get to bless the church. They get to bless other believers if they're walking in the way they should, right? So you work hard knowing that there's a downstream effect to your hard work. I know we were talking about money, but like we're looking at this and we're saying, okay, these guys probably didn't really have that much money. You were going to give me some wisdom around money, right? I guess. But this is not like a how to, be ri how to get rich wisdom around money. This is like how to be rich or how to be poor and deal with money and financial things. Right, that's, that seems to be the care of, of Paul here to his young Timothy. You know, I, I struggled with this. I actually worked for a long time. It was when I was, Mason was, um, well, Steph was pregnant and uh, with Mason, so my giant kid that's my same height that walks around here, and um, he's 15 and a half now, but I worked for a, 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 a believing family. They run a pretty large um, I use the word empire as in a negative thing earlier, so I wouldn't say empire, but they owned a large, large company and all Christians, professing Christians, and I had a hard time working for them. I saw their stinginess. I saw their, um, uh, just what I saw as self-serving behavior constantly, and I saw how hard they pushed me and how little they understood where I was at. 
And I say all that in a certain way because that's how I perceived it because of my attitude. I didn't see all the good they did for the church. You know, I found out just like a little while ago that they actually wanted to uh, carry the note on one of the churches because they had the means to. They wanted to, uh, they, they blessed and they gave away vehicles to people in the church who needed them. And I didn't see my part in that. I didn't get to experience that blessing because I was so focused on me, right? And not what God was doing. I had no First Timothy 6 in my brain, in my heart. And so uh, I was telling a friend about that as I was studying this uh, on Wednesday. I was like, maybe I need to reach out to them and let them know. I actually did. I had resentment towards them and didn't see the big picture of what was happening here. And, um, and maybe, maybe some of you guys need that too. I don't know. I don't know what God's doing in your heart right now. So in verses 1 and 2, we see how the slave or servant is to act. And we also see two really key, and these are big, you guys, big aspects of God's heart as well. So in verse 1, it says that God cares more about our witness that we have with other people than he cares about improving our financial situation. If he cared about that, he would tell us how not to be slaves. Hey, are you a slave for an unbelieving master? Let me tell you some tactics about how to get out from under that unbelieving master, and then you become a master yourself. Nope, doesn't go there. Instead, he says, this is how you be content and you utilize right where you're at the opportunities that you have. So he cares more about our witness than our financial situation. And that might be hard for some of us to hear, that God cares more about your witness than your finances. Okay? Verse 2 So you're working for a believing master, huh? See the downstream effect of all that that we were just talking about? That's because God cares more about his church, more about the body than he does about your financial situation. Okay? Because if it was not true, again, the same would apply as it did in verse 1. At least here, there would be an opportunity for him to say, you know what you should do if you work for a believing master? Go to them. Say, hey, I'm a Christian too. Don't you think I should probably be elevated up a little bit? Nope. It's not there. It's literally not there. If that's hard for you guys to see, um, verse 3 will start to give us some ideas about the fact that false teachers were actually doing this. They were actually trying to do the reverse of this, I should say. They were trying to use their godliness, their religion, their faith as a means of gain rather than a means of witness and taking care of the church. So verse 3 says, Teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up. With conceit and understands nothing, he has an unhealthy craving of, for controversy and for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and depraved of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Godliness for gain, it, that last portion right there, and then in the very first portion it says a different doctrine. Godliness for gain is a different doctrine. You see that? The prosperity gospel, i.e., I'm a Christian, so therefore I should constantly be improving my financial situation, my relationship situation. Everything should be getting better and better and better and better and better and better in my life all the time is not the gospel. I was waiting for a hook to slide me off the, <laughs> out of the front here. You guys, godliness for gain is not the gospel. We gain Christ. We don't gain things. We don't gain nice cars, trucks, whatever. In fact, you might lose all that if you become a Christian. God might call you away from all that because gaining Christ 
and what he actually has for you is way better than anything else. If we start looking at the gospel as a tool to improve our position in the same way that the world measures improving your position, it's just another self-help book. That's dangerous. That's a different gospel. That's a different doctrine. And if you see here, this is not a good place to be. Suffering is something we don't like to talk about. Why is this pushed in and sandwiched or slid in right next to money? Why did we talk about poor, uh, needy, and rich down here at the bottom, and then right in the middle talk about this? Because there's traps. There's traps when you try to improve constantly your financial position. Okay? Suffering is more tied to the life of a Christian and to the life of maturity. You can read Romans 5. You could read Psalms. You, I mean, you go everywhere. Literally, there's hundreds of examples about this in the Bible. And literally, for the sake of time and time alone, I won't go into them all. But if we're reading our Bibles, we'll see them. We're supposed to align with Christ, even in his suffering. Verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness is a means of gain in the verse before. Godliness with contentment. All I need is godliness is gain. Two words used one horribly, don't do that, and one as, hey, you have godliness, be content with that. That's the game. Not godliness plus. Just godliness. Contentment is where God has you. Contentment in where God has you, excuse me, is the game. He isn't, like I said, telling the slave how to become free, how to become wealthy. Don't you think if you were a slave, you'd want to hear that? You'd want to hear like, hey, you want to know how to get out of those? Get out, of, out from under this person. Stop dealing with their attitude or their whatever. I, I do. I do want to hear. That's not important to me right now. What's important to me is that you are a witness right where you are at. What's important to me is that the church as a whole is taken care of. It's not the prosperity gospel. And there are churches, you guys, this morning that have 50 times the amount of people in them because they preach that. And people love to hear it. That they're going to improve their situation because they showed up on a Sunday morning or they showed up on a Wednesday or they showed up on a whatever or because they read their Bible that they're going to improve those financial positions. You know, why did my portfolio go down? Nope, I must not have been praying enough. It's like, it's not, it doesn't work like that. It's not how the Christian life really works. Um, so contentment is really the, <laughs> the kryptonite of the prosperity gospel, and it helps us uh, avoid the trap of materialism. So verse 9 and 10, let's go there. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. So verse 9, so the 9 and 10 have the two traps really outlined. Verse 9 talks about this desire to be rich. Okay, so maybe you're a slave, you're trying to be content where you're at, and maybe you're like, I'm not a slave. I'm, not, I'm just talking about people who work for someone else right now, who rely on somebody else for taking care of them in some way, shape, or form. Okay? This desire to be rich, and it talks about it where it goes. It's a, it actually moves you towards ruin, destruction. And maybe in your head you have this um, rich person in your mind. You're like, I'm not rich. I'm not worried about that. I, that's not me you're talking to right now. I'm not talking about those of you guys who are rich. I'm talking about those of you guys who desire to be rich. And I would say, hey, raise your hand if you desire to be rich. But then I have to raise my hand too. 
that could be hard, right? You don't even have to be wealthy, but the desire for that is a very real danger. And then you go into verse 10, and I, I think it's often quoted as sort of like this, um, this test, right? People go, uh, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And they're like, whoa, whoa, I don't love money. I don't love money. I just, I just really, really enjoy the places that it'll take me and the clothes that it buys me, right? There's not enough kids in here for me to say the drip that I get. You know what I mean? But like, I just really enjoy, I enjoy the security that I have because of it. And if I lose a bunch of it, I have a horrible day. And if I get a bunch of it, I have a great day, but I don't love it. It's like, you sure? Are you sure? It's, <laughs> you guys, this, this desire to be rich and this love of money, it's not a game. Okay? Paul is taking time to make every point he can to Timothy that you need to steer clear of money. Are you telling me right now to sell everything I have, Pastor Ben? I'm not not telling you to sell everything you have. I'm telling you if you're a slave, be content. I'm telling you if you desire to be rich, you're going to fall into ruin and destroy yourselves. I'm telling you if you love money, expect pain and probably end up wandering away from the faith. That's what I'm telling you about money. I mean, how many of you know somebody who isn't in fellowship right now, isn't here anymore because they're working, because they're pursuing something else, because their faith was literally strangled by the American dream. I think churches in general are starting to kind of get smaller. Now, I think that there's this cool thing happening with the Lord, and he's doing the revival because people are seeing what's happening when they chase money. And they go, God, you're doing something. And it's not around chasing that. But there are, the, the, what the fact of the matter is, there are more people chasing that than ever before. I don't know. How many of us, actually, I'll say this. Do I take the pursuit of money and more and security more serious than I take the pursuit of holiness? I asked myself that question this morning and I've asked myself that question a few times this week. And maybe you think it's a good idea to ask yourself it too. But what do we do? What, what are we really left with here? I think the answer is in verse 11. I don't think it. I see it. And you should too. It says, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things. I remember another story about someone who had to flee. It was Joseph, Potiphar's wife. He ran. He literally got out of there because he knew the dangers that remained if he stayed a young man and a beautiful woman with money and power, and he ran. You guys, hopefully you see this love of money and you go like, God, I need to repent of this. I need to run from this. I need to turn from this. And you give me money, great, whatever. If you take it, it's good, whatever. It's yours anyway. And I came into this world with nothing, and I can leave with nothing. Godliness for gain doesn't work. Godliness alone is good enough for me. God's so good. He knows that we need to pursue things, though. If I'm not running after money, 
what in the world am I going to spend my days doing? What am I going to do? The problem is not running after something. It's running after the wrong thing. So it says here, if you keep reading, after he says flee these things, he says pursue righteousness. I would love to break down every word here, but this, you guys, is your job now, Bereans. Godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, maybe even translated resolve, gentleness, right? We need to be pursuing those things. How hard is it? How hard are those things? One, we have them all in Christ, and then we work them out, and we're constantly doing it day by day by day. There's no time to chase money. You're like, oh, don't go to work tomorrow? I hope you're not hearing that. You have a master, you have a job, go there and be a witness. Provide for the church. says, fight the good fight of faith, take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the pursuit, presence of many witnesses. You guys, fight the good fight of faith. It's not going to be easy. Why use the language fight? You could just say follow for the faith or what? Fight. Okay? You've got to be ready to fight. The Christian walk is not for pansies. You know, like you got to be willing to do it. You got to be willing to say, hey, God, I'm going to lay my life down even when my sinful self says, pick it up and do it on your own. I don't care if you're five or 50, seven or 70, okay? You guys, you have to lay down your life. It says, take hold of eternal life to which you were called. We need an eternal mindset. We've got this idea that that tomorrow matters way more than eternity. You're like, I don't think that, but we live like that. We live like that. Total traps, you guys. Up until this point, and I could... The, the, the last portions here of this, uh, this kind of, there's like a little subsection here through verse 16, you guys. I'm going to let you dig into that a little bit yourself as well. But when you look at this now, we've missed one huge demographic of people that represents like 1%. It's the rich. Okay? You're like, maybe, maybe you're in here and you're part of the one percenters. And maybe because we're Americans and we look at the grand scheme of like, um, cultures and development and technology, we'd all say, yeah, because we all have phones and we all have flushing toilets and um, whatever. Sometimes my kids don't use their flushing toilet. It just drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I called my son in the other day. I'm like, hey, side point, it's not in my notes. Um, Maybe because of that, in that context, you guys, we look and we say, I'm rich. I'm rich because I live in America. I'm rich because I have a roof over my head. Great. Then this section applies to you. And if you're like, I'm rich because I have more money than all of you. Cool. This section applies to you. Do you see what I did there? Yeah. Who's it apply to Okay, yeah, good. I did it right then, okay? So, what to do if you are rich, okay? It says it right here in verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. So what do you do if you're rich? You don't have all the same struggles, that we were talking about before, if you're really thinking that way, okay? You've, you've actually achieved and attained and laid hold of everything that the American dream says you can have, and you have it. You have it. 
how do you not trust in that? How do you not just say, I'm just a little bit better than the next guy or the next gal or that country or that people, whatever? How do you not? Well, God says, don't be full of yourself. He says, don't set your hope on the uncertainty of riches. You guys, I'm going to give you just a, oh gosh, a, a very hazy overview of a financial situation of my own in this past year. Anybody know about crypto? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Crypt, no, we won't leave it. We won't leave it just at that. I'll tell you this. So you take an investment with one comma, put it over here, and then I got back a return with two commas. One comma to two commas. Okay? Take the minimal investment you could have with one comma and take the minimal return you could get with two commas. And you're going like, okay. No wonder Ben has all this time to preach. <laughs> Uh, yeah, crypto, <laughs> back to one comma. <laughs> you guys, riches are uncertain. You know what's good about that story is I can laugh about it because, and my wife can laugh about it, because when we were there, I looked at him like, we could just sell this. And just be done. The way we live, what I'm used to, we could be done. So what would we do? It's like, I'd probably go to the gym like three, four days a week, five days a week maybe. She's like, maybe six. I'm like, yeah, probably six. And uh, we'd probably do ministry for the Overcome Project. Yeah, okay, cool. Would you be serving in church? Yeah, definitely, definitely be serving in church, maybe even more. Okay, so what do we need this money for? You know, you ruin like one or two relationships because of the people who are kind of investing this with you. You ruin these two friendships. I'm like, oh, what does that do to my witness for the Lord? Where does it say my hope is? My treasure. It's kind of obvious, right? Praise God, you didn't test me with three commas. Okay. <laughs> You guys, I don't know if he's talking to rich believers or rich unbelievers here, okay? Because he could just be talking to just to both, and I don't think it really matters. I think the money trap is the same whether you're born again or if you've never heard the name of Jesus. Money is just such a draw. It is so alluring to so many of us. But Paul's just commanding from them through Timothy the same thing. A new focus and a new treasure. New focus and a new treasure. And I just want to, as we wrap up, and I'll do one final verse as we close. You guys, Paul's focus to Timothy, thereby God's focus for us, was never improvement of our financial situation. It wasn't. Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything, everything he has, and buys the field. You guys, if there is anything that you treasure more than Christ, I would tell you this, you should sell it. And you guys should, you'll gain Christ. And maybe it doesn't mean literally sell. Maybe it means lay at the foot of the cross. You do that business with God. You do that work with God. That's not mine to do. It's the one place where God tells us how to be rich. How to have treasure. Sell the things that possess you so you can lay hold of Christ in the kingdom. 
A relationship with Jesus is so much better than money. No more chasing. No more pursuing. No more rat race. No more lie of the American dream. Praise God we live where we live. But it is a trap as well. Be careful with your money. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you've uh, given us so many examples in your word of money. You've given us wisdom uh, around practical things in life which are so helpful. But I pray that we wouldn't get lost in how practical they are for this life. You'd help us remember to have an eternal mindset that you're leading us and guiding us towards things that actually matter. God, we don't want to get caught up in small, little joys like dollars or cars or houses or vacations, Lord. We want the biggest joy, and that's you. We want to be content, Lord, with godliness, and we want to pursue it. We want to fight the good fight of faith. Lord, I know that I'm in here with a bunch of people from all different backgrounds, Lord, and together we just, we know Lord, that you are better, far better than any treasure that this world could give. In your name, amen.